Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for your patience. Um, Christina may say more, but it sounds like her institution is shutting down their internet. So we did some um, last minute brainstorming and she's joining us on her phone and I'll go ahead and share my screen instead. But we're really glad you're here today. Welcome to the Open Education Network's Pub 101. My name is Phoebe and I am the Grant Project Manager at Open Oregon Educational Resources. And I also serve on the Pub 101 Committee, which has been really fun for me this year. And I'll be your host and facilitator today. Um, as a friendly reminder, we do have our um, orientation document, which I will put in the chat. And this is kind of your go-to roadmap for our schedule, links to session slides and video recordings. And then I did want to follow up on one thing from our last session. So for those of you who've been following the last few sessions, our presenter from last week, Jacqueline, did go into the alt tag homework and provide notes and feedback in response to what you wrote. So some of you may, um, tried out writing alt tags or alt text, and um, Jacqueline did respond in there with comments of her own. So I'll share that link as well. And then in just a minute, I'll be handing it off to Christina. And actually, Christina, I was going to ask you how to say your last name. Trinnell. Trinnell. Thank you. Yes. Christina Trinnell. And Christina is an assistant dean at Montana State University Library. She's talking about inclusion today. So we'll leave time at the end for your questions and conversation, and I'll um, monitor the chat as well. And many of you may have experience on this topic. And we invite you to share that experience and any resources that you have that relate to our topic. That is always a bonus of this group is um, the sharing of resources that occurs in the chat. So just a couple of housekeeping details. This webinar is being recorded and we will add it to our YouTube Pub 101 um, playlist. And I'll go ahead and put that link there now. You can also find the last two sessions there already. And um, we do use community norms, and those mean that we're committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment. So please join us in creating a safe and constructive space. And um, there's a companion source for our sessions. I imagine you're in there. I know when I went through the Pub 101, I used that Canvas course a lot, and I've actually referred back to it quite a bit too in the last year. So I'll just also share that one last link to our Canvas curriculum where you can find a lot of our resources. And now I'll hand things over to Christina to talk about inclusion and I'll start sharing my screen so that we can all see her slides. Thanks, Phoebe. Um, yeah, we might be a little glitchy today because I am, yeah, hosting from my cell phone um, in the best corner of cellular service I can find on campus. <laughs> and, um, Phoebe will be sharing slides since I don't have access to your computer all of a sudden. So I appreciate your patience with that. And as Phoebe said, um, I'm gonna talk about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in publishing. And one of the things that I want to assure you as we're going in, that the slides are linked into um, the class notes document, as well as a couple of resources that I will mention throughout. So um, I'm not just gonna talk at you today, but hopefully give you some tools and some perspective on how to use those. So if you could go to the next slide, please. So today we're gonna talk about how to incorporate active engagement with DEI in our publishing programs and that may be you're you're doing your first book or considering your first book or you have a whole program um, what I want to talk to you today about is an approach and so um, part of that is to, um, honoring the risk and responsibility that we have to incorporate DEI uh, practices what that looks like an approach to doing this that should feel safe and comfortable and achievable. Um, and then ways that uh, DEI can be incorporated into course materials that we're developing or our authors are developing. And all of that is through a lens of care. So I like to focus on self-care as we do this kind of work because it, it does come with a weight that some of us feel um, and in and, and a way to, um, I guess my hope is to empower you also to 
jump into the waters of DEI work a little bit more uh, with less hesitation by the end. So those are my goals. Um, so you can go to the next slide. The first thing that I like to start off with, with any DEI conversation, well, most conversations actually, is um, a grounding exercise. So I would like you to take just a minute with me and do a um, mindfulness practice. Um, so if you want to close your eyes or turn off your screen or anything for just a moment, and I would like you to, and I'll guide us through this, um, I would like you to think of one thing, and I know there may be many, so think of one thing that is um, causing you stress at the moment or a stressful thing that's been on your mind. And I want you to give that just a minute to identify what it is. And then I would like us all to take a deep breath together. So if you breathe in through your nose for a beat of about five seconds. And then let that out through your mouth. And now I would like you to take a moment and think of something that brings you joy. We're gonna find three joyful things. So something that brings you joy and just think about that thing and what that looks like and what it feels like. And now I invite you to think about another joyful thing that um, brings you peace or laughter, but fills you with joy and focus on that for just a moment. And finally, I'd like you to think of a third thing that brings you joy and what that is, what it looks like, how that makes you feel. And if you would, you can open your eyes as you feel comfortable. Um, and we can go to the next slide. Uh, as we start our conversation, I like to begin with that grounding moment because we A, have so many things that impact us every day and they can be overwhelming. And um, if you've ever had any kind of equity conversation with me, these are the two phrases that I always say, that equity work is human work and it is honest work and that takes something from us. And so uh, it's important to ground yourself in what you can let go and the good things that you can focus on. So as I start talking, um, if you feel like sharing your three joyful things in the chat, please feel free to do so. Um, if you don't, that's okay. All right, uh, next slide, please. So, as you're sharing in the chat, um, when we talk about diversity, when we talk about equity, inclus inclusion, um, racism, accessibility, all of these things can bring up a lot. And depending um, on what institution you're working at, there can be an additional layer of politics, um, maybe that you agree with or disagree with, uh, different personality types, and all of those are apprehensive. So the first thing I want you to think, um, do for me as we begin this talk is to think about, are you comfortable in this space? Is this a space you're comfortable talking about, um, learning about, excited about, apprehensive about, um, all of those things. And as we go through uh, today, those are pieces that um, I think if you keep coming back to your comfort level um, and, and what this type of work brings up for you, that will help you be better and more effective at what you want to accomplish with it. Next slide, please. So the first thing I want to jump into is some ground rules and really your role as a publishing support person, whether you're in a library or other instructional support office. Um, the most important thing is that you care for yourself. You're only effective if you're cared for. So that's really key. And so the first thing uh, 
that we have to do um, and, and our foundation for ourselves is, are you willing to accept the risk? And by risk, I mean, will those conversations, if you have these conversations with authors or others, uh, colleagues and in your campus communities, will they always go well? Will you say the right thing? Will you say something wrong? Um, will you make a mistake? And odds are, because equity is human and humans are flawed, we won't always do it well or perfectly and we might make mistakes and that's okay. It's really important to be honest about that. Oh, I said something and as soon as it came out of my mouth, maybe it wasn't the best thing or help me understand this approach. Um, being really honest about your imperfection as you go into these conversations is really key. So accept that doing this kind of work does come with some risk. Um, and then as, as support for publishing programs, um, I'd like to think about, or I'd like you to think about what your responsibility and your role is. Um, as someone who's helped many authors finish and publish their books, there's a lot that I would um, do differently, but their work is their work, it's not mine. So what is my role in helping them get to it? Uh, and my role and the, the role that I'm hoping to give you uh, some guidance on today is to offer them perspective, to help them to think about their work that they're creating or adapting um, with a different perspective, a different lens. And maybe that means setting some standards uh, within your publishing program or just offering some guidance to those authors. So the responsibility for creating uh, really inclusive works is not the publishing support persons, um, but we do have a responsibility to keep helping publishing in higher ed and academia be better. And I, and I think that includes this element of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Next slide, please. So be honest. Um, we can only affect change if we openly address the truth. And that can be, I, I really tried to do this well and it, it did not work out or it did not meet the need that I intended it to meet. So be honest about that, that's okay. Actively care for, for yourself. And what I mean by that is, if you know you're gonna have a difficult conversation or if there's something that um, you did that maybe you're now thinking, oh, that that came out wrong or it, it doesn't look quite right. Taking time to give yourself uh, space to come to terms with that, to be okay with that, knowing that DEI work sometimes takes more out of us mentally than other parts of our normal work. So giving our space, self space and attention to take that time um, and come into it differently. Um, and then recovery time. It's kind of like when you're an introvert and you teach and then that's a great energy, but then a lot of us have to go back and, and recover and decompress from that experience. And DEI work can have the same tools. So take care of yourself and listen to yourself, um, which is a better practice than avoiding or um, not engaging in something that feels maybe unattainable or too, too um much like a minefield that we don't wanna go into. So be honest with yourself and care for yourself. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so why we still get it wrong? I'm gonna go through this part really quick because it's just a little bit related to our topic today. Um, so I want us to think about this lens that I, I um, am giving you today. Uh, I want us to think about it from an overall perspective. And the problem that we have in um, academic publishing is not a new problem. And um, I pulled a couple of terms from systemic racism, uh, the definition that's in Wikipedia that I, I really think are pertinent, um, that systemic racism is embedded in normal practices, that it originates in operation of established and respected forces of society. 
And what is more established and respected than academia, right? It's, it's not new. So the ways of thinking about how to include um, diversity, equity, and inclusion within our normal practices are very similar to addressing something like systemic racism. It's, it's embedded, it's throughout. And so what we really have to do is change our ways of thinking because the normal ways of doing something like writing a textbook, um, I'm experiencing from decades, centuries of history of this is how we do it. This is how we include information. And inclusion is requiring us to look at it a little differently. Next slide, please. Um, so perspective, it's how we look at the world, um, what we're thinking of. And so as working with the faculty author, but also thinking about yourself and your normal practices and what you're hoping to build with your publishing program. We think about it from what we know, what we've seen, what we experience, um, our perspective. And so we might think that we're very open-minded and broad and trying to make sure that we do it really well, but that, and our perspective is wide, but truthfully, it's just ours. And it might be as small as a ladybug on the, <laughs> the shore, right? It's it's very limited. Um, and I, I equate that with publishing because, um, well, I'll kind of get there roundaboutly. Um, I wanna talk for a second about Ralph Waldo Emerson. So Emerson wrote this great essay on art. And what he says about artists is that they're always trying to create something right? Creation is the aim. Create something new, something you've never seen, something you've never experienced. Authors could be thought of in the same way. And what Emerson posits is that you cannot do that. You can never create something entirely new, that everything you do is highly impacted by your community, your family, your life experience, your education, the politics um, and perspectives in your country and your time. And all of those influence how you create something. And what he actually says is creation um, is a limitation. It, when we try to create something new and we're only using our own ideas and thoughts, we're limited to what we can make. But when we start using other people's ideas and thoughts and bringing in perspectives outside of our own, then we can actually do something great. Next slide, please. Um, so what we're doing, our approach today, is getting authors um, to think about things. Our job is not to fix them or their work or define how it should look, but getting them to think about things in a broader perspective, to think about um, students that they might not have considered before, um, and, and those pieces. So what is their goal? Their goal is to teach, right? how can we help you? Well, we can give you this guideline of ways to think about structuring your textbook. In Pub 101, you'll learn about structure and headings and, um, and different rules of how to lay out a textbook and not really necessarily what material. So this is giving them um, a perspective of what kinds of material and other things to include that they might not have thought of. So you're helping them by opening their eyes to new ways of thinking. So that's the approach. Um, and, and helping them to not be limited in what they create. Um, so next slide, please. Okay. Uh, the system or this, the system of higher ed, the system of academic publishing um, has, has largely been about quality content and delivering content. Um, and when we're not using an inclusive lens in the creation of that content, um, and the list here I'm, I'm pulling from uh, an open Oregon white paper that came out years ago. So um, I'm just gonna cite them verbally. Uh, what we're actually doing is ensuring that students are less prepared to engage in a multicultural world. Um, they're getting one-sided or skewed 
views of an issue while demonstrating the fallacy of one truth thinking and learning. Uh, we're ensuring our students fail to learn how to speak and act, interact with a diverse world without propagating a structure of inequity and or bias. Um, and they're in inadvertently learning implicit bias that supports the structure of systematic oppression that um, we have seen in for decades and centuries. So if you ask a faculty author if this is their goal, their answer is going to be no, no, of course not. But when they're creating something and they're using their lens and their perspective, this happens inadvertently. It's not a wrong thing that they're doing. It just happens because we are who we are. Um, so what we're trying to do is break down the system and give them a way to think about this uh, in a much more diverse um, and equity focused way. Next slide, please. Okay, so that was the background. Now I'm gonna give you the how to do this. Um, and I did not mention this before, but please put questions you have in the chat. Um, we will have time for them and I'd love to hear your thoughts and ideas on these. Okay, so the first question that um, I give to authors is who is their audience? And that is because we tend to talk in higher ed with certain vocabularies, certain understandings. When I explain something in a written work, I'm doing it from my perspective and my knowledge. But the intent is that it reaches someone who has a different perspective, a different knowledge base, and maybe different vocabularies. And that's something textbooks today don't often think about. Next slide, please. So by asking that, um, we're really not, we're creating a lot of professional writing, some technical writing that might be above what our students have the ability to, um, or initial ability to apprehend um, or comprehend, sorry, wrong way. So first question, are the vocabularies approachable? We need to build them as we go. We want students to learn those uh, vocabularies, ways of thinking, ways of speaking about our topics, but initially are they approachable? Do they meet a student where they're at when they walk into the classroom for the first time? Or are they starting a student above a level that they can get to? So that's a barrier. Um, are the scenarios relatable? So uh, I had a great um, colleague who talked about a business textbook that she had been using with her class and it was talking about investments and uh, one section on real estate investments and all of the housing scenarios were talking about like $1.2 million housing um, investments and what this looks like and depreciation and, and things like this. And she was like, that's not a reality that any student in my classroom will experience or has experienced. Like maybe they will, but they don't understand it. So it doesn't seem relatable. They don't engage with the material. So can we give them scenarios that actually fit the students in our classrooms um, that are relevant versus just applicable to the content that we're trying to teach? So making sure that's um, a way of thinking is really important. Next slide. Diversity. Some of these are not going to be new concepts to all of you, but are we including a diversity of uh, representation in the examples, um, including images, um, the types of experiences, like I just said, uh, but different types of people, different walks of life experiencing those? Uh, are the names that we're using um, and pronouns, are they diverse? Do they represent? names that I know. Can I look up names from other communities or cultures or countries and include those? Uh, ident helping you, sorry, names really are key to helping a student, a reader identify themselves in the work. Is there a place for me in the business world? Is there a place for me in the geology world? 
do I belong here? Am I gonna be able to learn this? These are things that students are thinking about. So by creating content that includes wide representation is enabling students to identify themselves in the content. Um, formats, obviously, <laughs> we want low to no cost formats, um, but we also want to make sure that there's options. So working with authors, who are creating maybe a GitHub format or delivering their content in PDF and putting it in the open education library um, or open textbook library. Are there multiple formats? Is there a, a link to a print on demand version? Do we have audio options available or translation options available? So having them think about that at the start is really helpful because then you don't develop something in warm format that's going to require a significant amount of work to translate to another. That's also something as a support person for you to think about what options can we provide. Next slide, please. Okay, accessible. So you heard uh, my colleague Jackie talk about accessibility yesterday or last week, which is really key. Um, and go ahead and next slide, Phoebe. So we wanna meet those accessibility standards, right? And I consider accessibility um, a quality check that we should be doing for all materials that we provide. In addition to accessibility standards, a couple of accessibility pieces um, that we don't often think about is uh, do students know how to use this resource? And so um, including or having authors think about including a to the reader section. So you'll see in some publisher textbooks where it'll have a, a, a box or a, a bullet that it pulls aside at the start of each chapter that says, here's the key words, key terms, questions you should answer. Uh, we don't often think about when we're creating those to include those. Those are really helpful for a student to look at and say, okay, not only am I reading this, but the, here's what I need to make sure I'm retaining and identify those pieces going in. For someone who has um, any kind of reading disability, that's incredibly helpful for them to overcome and pull out the pieces that are essential to them. So a to the reader guide or how to use this text or how to use this material guide is really key. We also think about accessibility in relation specifically to the text, um, but challenging our authors to think about it in relationship to all ancillary materials and how they're connected to the text is really important. So student with any kind of reading and or learning disabilities, um, connecting various pieces of information is sometimes a challenge. So the more we can make that explicit instead of implied is really important. So if I have a video that I want students to watch and they're reading this article and they're doing my text, am I including in the text itself or somewhere within my um, or shell or however I'm publishing this, links to those materials and connecting them in writing. So you will see in video how to build a person or whatever my video is, these things, and then explaining those things in the text. So the more that we can make those connections and learning obvious initially helps our students to build those vocabularies, to build depths of understanding about our topic and advance. But we have to start out with some of that very explicit content. Next slide, please. Okay, content. I have found um, in my experience working with authors, this to be the trickiest part because they obviously, they're such subject experts and they know what they want to include. They know what they have to include. They know what they want their students to learn. So <clears throat> again, we are, our role is not to tell them what to put in, but to give them a guide of how to approach uh, their content and ways to think about it. Next slide. 
And this is the area that you might have some of those challenging conversations um, come up or happen. Hopefully not, but subject coverage. That's the first one. Um, is it honest and is it inclusive? So I'm gonna pick on history for an example, but um, this applies to all topics. So if I am writing um, the history of the women's suffrage movement, but I am only including, and I'm picking on a specific book actually, um, but I'm only including what um, I as the author AKA Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who wrote that. Um, if I'm only including the people that I know and the perspective that I've seen, how can that be a full history? Or am I actually being honest and acknowledging these are only the movements that the authors knows, know about? Um, if it was really inclusive, it would include all the types of coverage of my topic um, from the various perspectives. but. Uh, I don't always know those, so I might highlight within the text uh, gaps of my information knowledge or information coverage. Um, perspectives. Are perspectives widely included, inclusive, and relevant to the subject? So am I only including perspectives about, say, the Gulf War, um, if I'm writing that text from political leaders and military people, or am I including perspectives, first person narratives from people who lived in um, those areas, who lived in Iraq and Afghanistan? Um, am I including their perspectives or people on the field or the average American? So are we including all the perspectives that matter? Um, and by that meaning inclusive and relevant. And then language is the language devoid of microaggression. So those are the kind of three biggies. And I'm gonna go into those a little bit more if you want to advance the slides. So addressing a topic. So thinking about other topics besides history, which is really easy to talk about missing perspectives. If I'm uh, working on a nursing text, am I including um, testimonials from patients? Am I including um, stories or biographies from uh, nurses from multiple cultures, races, genders? Um, am I acknowledging, and this is what I mean by, it addresses the topic fully without equivocation. If, am I acknowledging that there's other histories or other um, perspectives that are missing or might uh, advance further study? So adding that into your text and saying this is the limitation of what I'm creating, and here's some other resources, is really helpful. Next slide. Um, inclusive and relevant, uh, the perspectives that have long been overlooked by um, textbooks is first person accounts of peoples and groups relevant to the subject matter. So um, I gave you a Medical example, let's talk about science. Maybe um, scientists who did studies that weren't published because they went to smaller institutions, they were from um, different cultures or communities that didn't have an access to publishing platforms. Do I include research um, that impacted maybe negatively communities um, of color, communities of different cultures? So being really honest to include all of that and thinking about whose voice is missing. And that's the question I really like to um, give. Whose voice is missing in this content? Who does this not represent? And how can I include it or include links to ideas to further study or further information? Next slide. Um, language that is inclusive and devoid of microaggressions. So this is a, a big one um, and really easy to do uh, unintentionally because how we speak is again like that systematic racism mindset. It's just who we are. It's the, the vocabularies we've learned and it's not intentional. Um, so being really intentional about looking through how you're addressing a topic um, 
using gender neutral language, first person language throughout the um, person first, sorry, I said that backwards, language throughout the material is key. Uh, and one of the resources that um, I mentioned that we share, which is linked in your class notes, is a guide to all of this. So it's kind of a checkbox with resources to each one of these. So you can point people towards that. Next slide. Wait, Christina, tell me, where's that resource? You said it's in the class notes. <laughs> it is. Okay. Um, and and I'll, yeah, I, it might be highlighted on my slides too. <laughs> but either way, I'll make sure that we have it. Um, but it's, I think it's in the community hub as well. And that's a rubric for um, assessing DEI in um, course materials. And then also uh, there's a whole list of resources for inclusive language under um, every different category that we wanna make sure that we're connecting with. Okay, we'll try to find it and put it in the chat. Thanks, Christine. Okay. okay. Um, so I know that was kind of a lot and I would love to have a conversation for the rest of our time together. Um, the, the overlying principle that I want to uh, make sure that we all share and walk away with is what is our role? And, um, and I, I like this kind of swanky, sassy librarian picture. <laughs> <laughs> that I found, but um, I go back to the principle of my profession, which is always ask a librarian. When in doubt, ask a librarian. And what is their role? It's not to know all the answers, it's to help. And so as a supporting role as someone building a program, learning about building a program, our job is to help. And that might be to ask a friend, ask someone else, ask this community, which is here to help with those kinds of questions. So we do have a few resources um, that I wanna highlight. One is the rubric um, that has a lot of inclusive language guides to it uh, that um, was built by the OEN DEI working group. So that's a great resource. And the other is kind of a one, that's well, a two page, I think, a two page, um, checklist that you can give to faculty authors uh, that we also have on, I believe, a community hub um, that goes through all of this and asks the questions. So you don't have to feel responsible for asking all these questions, um, but it goes through all of these areas and says, have you thought about, did you include, and it gives them some resources. So those are, widely available um, and anyone who wants to um, update those or reach out to me with questions, information's on the slides, but you're welcome to. So last slide, please. I think it's the last one. Oh, two more. Um, so this is kind of my mindset that I keep. Uh, creating something great is much simpler than trying to repair something mediocre. And so, um, that's how I approach DEI with uh, authors, is we want you, as you're putting it together, to have this perspective, this mindset, this kind of checklist of things to think about. So you're embedding or engaging with these practices from the start, rather than coming with something and thinking, okay, here's all of the ways that we need to fix this. Um, my colleague, uh, Jackie, that you heard from last week, always says remediation is so much more work because you have to go back and look at everything. But if we're thinking about these things, we can create something better that will take much less work. So um, that's the mindset and the approach that I hope you all can hear and uh, will take with this type of inclusive practice in your publishing programs. Last slide. It's my nice happy picture of how hopefully our perspectives change. Um, and it's just a matter how we're looking at things. So uh, that is what I had to share. So, and I haven't been um, seeing the chat. So I'm gonna click on this. Um, we have one um, question a little bit up above just about the, um, challenge and I'll go ahead and stop share so we can kind of see each other here but the um 
This person, uh, Evangeline, said there's been so much debate over person first language in different communities. I find myself using both within the same text. I have no idea if that's a good idea or not. It just like that, it feels intentional. So I don't know if you have any comments about that. I, I shared one guide that I know we've been relying on quite a bit at Open Oregon Educational Resources, but it, it doesn't necessarily answer that specific question. Um, I don't know if you have comments about that, Christine, or if other folks here do. I do. And um, one the the kind of standard that I go with is um, what do the communities themselves want to be? What language do they want to use? So there's been some back and forth and and there's been times where with good intentions, people that are not in that community, um, and, and I will use indigenous um, nations, uh, non-indigenous people like myself think, okay, let's do this better. Let's, here's some language that we'll use um, that, and we create standards or ideas and try to normalize them without going to that community. But if you actually go to that community, they say, no, this is what we want. This is, we don't wanna be called Native Americans. We want to be called American Indians or, or something. So when in doubt, if you can find a source and the rubric um, page has a list of the, a bunch of those, especially with first person um, or person first language um, that are all coming from, an organization uh, or that community itself. So that's kind of my go-to. And again, I I think that honesty, saying, you know what, I'm I'm trying, but I might have got it wrong. Is there a better way? And keep asking that is really the key. So I like the question, Evangel Evangeline. Um, I think it's a it's a moving target as communities feel more empowered and um, have space to actually say, here's 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 how we want to be referred to. Here's what makes sense for us. Here's what's honoring and not um, dismissive. Other questions? people might have. We do have time for more questions or comments or if folks have resources they rely on. Um, it's always nice to learn from other people's experiences. Thanks, I, I'm glad you like the guide. I think it's really helpful. I think one of the most interesting, um, and there's a link to it in that as well, um, interesting pieces of information I learned over the last few years is about nonviolent communication. And that had me really changing how I worded everything from syllabi to um, emails to students um, and understanding the barriers that I, as a faculty member, was unintentionally putting up to my students uh, with the way that I communicated things like no late work accepted or um, just how we word and phrase things um, to different uh, cultures and perspectives, how that can establish a precedent where we hope it's just a starting point for a conversation. So um, if you have time that, and I will post it in the class notes just so it's surfaced a little higher, but um, that nonviolent communication uh, guide has really changed my, changed my worldview a lot, so. Christina, I relate to that too. As an instructor, I feel like when I started 12 years ago, I was so, yeah, just all the strict, like, yeah, kind of this language that, yeah, I've, I feel like I've moved 
or far along that continuum as well. That resonates with me what you're saying about about the kind of language you use, like in your syllabus and everything. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of ways that unintentionally we can put up barriers. And so I think just having a mindset of, okay, I'm gonna approach it and this, these are the things I'm gonna think about. And as you're creating or as you're building your program, going back and saying, okay, am I still thinking about all of these? Did I include, you know, if I'm a first generation college student who's never had any exposure to higher ed, would I know how to use a standard textbook? I might not, including things like a to the reader piece or something like that is making those kind of standard practice, I think would be beautiful. Okay, well, I will, um, that's what I had to share if there's no other comments. So again, everything's linked in class notes. I'll, I'll um, post in there and, and surface a, those resources a little bit more, but also if you have questions or um, thoughts that you'd like to share, I'm always happy to hear those. So feel free to reach out to me personally um, at any point. Thank you, Christina. Um, I really appreciate hearing um, your perspective on this. And I find it really important to hear this information in that context of self-care and also like that we're not gonna do it right every time and that all of that's okay. So thank you for naming all that. Um, we appreciate all of you for joining us today to learn about open textbook publishing. And we hope that as we continue to share our resources and recommendations, that one of your key takeaways is the sense that you're not alone in figuring out how to support open textbook authors, especially with today's topic of inclusion. And if you have more questions about today's session, you can reach out to Christina or use our class notes. We'll find that link here as well. And um, let's see, I'll put the class notes in the chat like that. And um, that concludes our session today. Thank you again for being here and Christina for being so flexible and joining on your phone. And we look forward to seeing you all next week. Thanks very much.